his job, I mean, I think his, what he was doing with the research. All right, for tonight's City Council Conference, we have one item on the agenda, and it's an update from Marion Hutchison, the City of Norman's representative of the Regional Transportation Authority of Central Oklahoma, and I'm uh, excited to hear the status of the many projects in our future. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, before I get started, let me just say this is kind of a different spot for me. I was just talking to Sean about this. I actually now work for you. I'm your representative for the city, and... I think this is one of the most exciting times. I've been working on this rail issue on the side. I'm not a professional in this business. I'm in the oil and gas business, but I put a lot of time and effort for probably about 12 years. And I'd say right now, uh, we are closer than we've ever been to actually getting this done and having a regional transit system uh, to kind of join all the other cities uh, that have progressed and you know bring us up to speed. So uh, Norman, in all the years I've been involved, I've worked with multiple mayors, multiple council members. I didn't have a son. My hair wasn't gray. He's 12 now. <laughs> and, you know. And, this will make your hair gray for and sure. And so it's a long process. And what I've learned is patience. And it's really important that as we go, you get every little piece you can until you put it together. And especially in this state and, you know, in this region, that's, that's a really important thing. But Norman has led the way constantly from the beginning. Norman has always led the way, uh, and the other cities have kind of followed. And uh, I give a lot of credit to um, former Mayor Rosenthal and Mayor Miller, and now uh, Mayor Clark, and I think uh, we're going to get this done. So uh, I've got, if you've looked at this, uh, you've got it now, and you can look through the PowerPoint on your leisure. It's, it's long, and it's been updated. I'm not going to into every detail it'll take too long i'm going to kind of skip through if there's something i skip and you see it and you have a question just stop me in the middle and ask me um, and there's a lot of information and hopefully this will tell you let you know how we got here and where we're going and you'll have a better understanding when we're done so uh intermodal regional rail transit systems is kind of the long technical term for what we're going to be discussing and most cities, most large cities throughout the country, you know, top 50 cities, already have these in place. They've had them for years. You've probably ridden some of them. Uh, Dart in Dallas, Denver RTD, Salt Lake City, UTA. Those are just some of the newer western ones. But we're, be we're behind. But the good news is we get to look at everybody else and see what they did, what didn't work, and what did work, and, and have our own system that... that works the best it can. Uh, so regional transit systems are essentially just, a, it's a comprehensive system to serve the mobility of the whole region. And typically that's a combination of modes, which is going to include bus, uh, commuter rail, light rail, modern streetcar, and those all integrate and work together through a intermodal hub. Uh, this picture down in the bottom is Dallas Union Station, it's one of the better ones in the region. It was uh, put together in the, in the 80s when DART started. And you can see you've got in that picture, just there's a light rail train and a commuter rail train and uh, everything integrates through the hub. Uh, and typically these are all operated by what's called a regional transit authority. And that essentially means they run the entire transit system. In most of these large cities, that authority operates all of the modes. There are different, there are a lot of different uh, models. There's some places where it's kind of broken up in agencies, but uh, the best effective way to run a full system is one uh, primary operating entity. Uh, so what does it mean when we say intermodal? That's just the seamless movement of passengers from one mode to another through a hub. The whole purpose of this is to provide efficient transportation options for your public. People will ride these if it is effective and gets them there timely and faster than what they can drive. And so one of the biggest factors is transferring. So you want to be able to transfer from one mode to another because you typically aren't going to be able to get exactly where you're going on a single mode. And so intermodal brings everything in. And here's a great example. I put this together a long time ago to help explain it. So on the left, that's multimodal. You've got multiple modes. 
you know, your bus may cross a train track, your streetcar may cross this and that, but they're really operating separately. Um, intermodal is a hub and everything comes together so you can <coughs> come in and out um, efficiently. Uh, this is a great example, one of the most modern ones. It's a beautiful facility. This is Denver Union Station's new intermodal hub. They started this process a number of years ago. You can see the old Union Station building. And really, it's not the building that's important. It's the terminal. The terminal is where all your tracks are, where your platforms are. The building is just a place to go hang out with, you know, when it's raining or waiting. But the way these work and the reason uh, they're so important is you've got to make sure that all of your uh, capacity for your different modes can come in and out of there so people can do this seamlessly. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of terms on types of rail transit vehicles so that everybody understands them. It's not uncommon. Everybody confuses this, even people that and talk about it frequently. So light rail, which if you've ridden the little light rail train in the system in Dart, Dallas, these are, are they're smaller, hence lighter vehicles. Their crashworthiness is less, so they're not allowed by the FTA to operate in mixed traffic, meaning on other rail tracks with freight and other trains. They have to be on their own dedicated right-of-way that you have to pay to acquire if you put these in. It's very expensive. They're electrified, so they've got their own electric system. Uh, they have more stops with electric motors. You have quicker acceleration because of your torque. And these were the most popular systems being put in in the 80s and 90s, but the price has skyrocketed. Putting in a light rail system now, average 100 to 200 million a mile, and that's I mean they, that's it's it's very expensive. Uh, so on the other side we have commuter rail, and these are essentially running on uh, existing tracks in current right of way, and that's shared right of way with one of the. Usually you're sharing it uh, with an agreement with one of the railroads. Sometimes you buy the the right-of-way privately and you operate that, but these are just locomotives. Uh, these are the more efficient ones. The ones you see here are kind of the uh, the most current uh, model that all the cities have been using. Uh, it's typically for longer distance operations. They actually reach higher speeds than light rail uh, with fewer stops, but they're more comfortable. Light rail trains don't have bathrooms. Uh, most commuter rails do, and they have work tables, and they're, they're great for getting work done. 25 to 50 million a mile is now kind of the average cost, which is affordable and uh, within the range of what we've always looked at. And most cities now, uh, including Dallas and others, they're starting to make their new lines commuter rail. They're kind of limiting light rail just because of the cost. Uh, some of you have seen the, I'm sure everybody's heard or seen the new Oklahoma City uh, streetcar that's now running. And these have become very popular. These are several from various cities. But the most important thing to think about here is how these are to serve the regional system. If you ride a commuter train from the station in Norman and you get off at the depot downtown Oklahoma City, you're not, that's your, not your final destination. You know, if you can walk, you can walk, or you can get a cab, but these serve as circulators. And so what you want to be able to do is step right off of your commuter train and step down and get right onto streetcar. And hopefully that system is set up. It'll get you within a block, a walkable block of just about any place you're going for work. So these are really important. We call them last mile components. Uh, rail transit has just a lot of benefits. Uh, it's very safe and efficient transportation. It uh, reduces emissions. Uh, you know, we have ozone issues here. Uh, one of the biggest things about these systems that beyond serving the public and uh, providing transportation for those who need it is that it's economic competitiveness. And so most cities are finding that these systems attract young, skilled workers, knowledge work set, they retain young people. They bring in businesses because people want to be able to utilize these systems and not have to drive their cars everywhere. And uh, there actually has been fairly good public support in the last six to eight years in Oklahoma City. A lot of quality of life benefits. Uh, this is going to be used whether you're going to school, 
traveling to medical offices, uh, any other public uh, destination. It really improves mobility. Uh, it's an option. You know, we're not trying to tell people you have to take a train and leave your car at home. It's just an option. Highways are still going to be congested. This, this reduces congestion, uh, improves air quality, but it is an option, and, and I can almost tell you that I don't know of a single system that's failed. So all of these that have actually been put into use, once they get going, the public wants more and more, and they expand, and, and it's just uh, really beneficial for local and regional communities. Uh, economic benefits. So transit-oriented development, if you've talked about TOD, that is all about development that happens around stations because people want to live close to where these stations are to utilize that for their lifestyle. And what that does is it creates new businesses around there, it raises property values, and that in turn raises local and state taxes. Uh, it enhances you know, downtown business districts, accelerates urban renewal. It's just, it's really a great economic tool. And so you always have to think of it in terms of both. It's, in, it's incredibly supportive for those who need transportation and transportation options, and it really does wonders for your economic business. Here's a couple of great examples on the top left. That's a Google Earth image I got of, of uh, a downtown Plano before a DART station was put in in the early 90s or yeah, early 90s. And then that exact same location and all of that development wasn't paid for by the RTA, that's the private development that went in because of a DART station. Uh, the picture in the bottom right was the all of the TOD that is still ongoing around Denver Union Station. All of those buildings are planned um, and it's an, on, it's an ongoing uh, project. The station's completed. A uh, couple of things to note that I think are important. A lot of, you'll hear some people that, you know, are naysayers about transit. Oh, it, you know, it doesn't make a profit. It costs more to operate than the fees. This is a chart done by the University of North Texas on their study that shows the fiscal impacts on tax revenues, additional tax revenues as a result of uh, TOD development in Dallas be due to the DART system. That's a hundred, that's annual, $127 million additional annual state, local taxes that come in because of all the additional property tax value. So, I mean, these are, these are just things that I think are real important to understand. Um, and this is uh, increased property values. They did a study on uh, properties uh, where DART went and control properties and the difference. I found these quotes some time ago, but I just think they're great. Economic success in the 21st century requires making our region attractive to an educated workforce. Corporations have discovered that a good transit system is essential to recruiting such talent. And that bottom one, I think, as we go forward, hopefully we're getting further along where everybody understands that one. Because um, it's really, it's not a uh, partisan issue. This is good for all, all of us. Uh, national trends, we've got retiring baby boomers who are going to want to make uh, greater use of transit to get further mobility. Uh, Again, millennials, Generation Y, they have lower rates of car ownership and, and prefer transit systems. And um, so it's, it's just going to, it's not just young people. Uh, and I'm, I'm approaching, you know, I'm at the end of the baby boomer cycle. I think I'm in the last year or so. Uh, hopefully this thing will be built by the time I retire and I can use it. <laughs> uh, user cost savings. This is a big deal. So besides all the time you sit in traffic, You'll see on there 273 hours stuck in traffic. This is from APTA, the American Public Transportation Association. By using this, these are what you save per year. Average of 4,400 miles of driving, 223 gallons of gas, and all your maintenance and everything. So uh, there's user savings. Uh, and it also benefits your transportation system. So by adding this to your system, it makes... Uh, you know, things easier for everybody, it lessens congestion, it reduces, one of the big things is vehicle miles traveled, uh, reduces that during peak travel periods. Uh, I like that picture down there. That's the Railrunner in New Mexico as it's flying down I-25 and 
Uh, there's probably an accident there. That's not commuter traffic, I don't think. But uh, I thought that that's a good example. And then the dark train flying by all the, you know, people in rush hour. Uh, so what's a model system look like? Uh, we like to emulate Salt Lake City. Uh, it's a similar uh, western type geographic town, politically, it's about the same size, and they just got started in the 90s. Actually, they took a chance when the Olympics came and said, hey, let's build a light rail line from, you know, Olympic uh, Stadium, wherever it was, to wherever we wanted to take it. And they just spent the money, and as soon as they put the line in, it's just everybody wanted more and more and more. And now they have full light rail and streetcar systems downtown. They have enhanced bus systems and commuter rail between uh, Ogden and Provo. Their total ridership, and this was an old slide, 2011, was 41 and a half million annual riders. Uh, it's a great system. They funded this whole thing. It's a 0.68 cent sales tax. It's a big system. Uh, but they've, they've got significant ridership. Um, I'll point this out, it's kind of important in a way. Um, their commuter rail line actually goes up to Ogden and serves, directly serves the front door of Hill Air Force Base. Hill Air Force Base is a competitor of Tinker and one of our planned uh, commuter rail corridors that's been in the works since 2006 in the fixed guideway study is direct commuter rail to the front door of Tinker. And so, um, it's a very it's very valuable from the military basis point of view. They think that's great. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, would they then participate in funding it? Is you know, there you there are some there's some probably private uh, public partnership arrangements that you might be able to make in certain things like that, like maybe uh, uh, the transit station and things like that. Uh, Midwest City Sorry. is a member, so they would be part of it. I don't know about the, the base itself, though. Um, a few years ago, in 2012, uh, Mayor Cornett, former Mayor Cornette of Oklahoma City, brought Mayor Becker from Salt Lake City to Oklahoma City to give uh, the keynote speech for the Mayor's Roundtable. And all he could talk about was how great transit has been for developing their region. And uh, one of the, that bottom quote, our ridership has doubled projections. Rail transit is making a huge difference in both where people concentrate their economic investments, but also in relie relieving congestion and providing a pretty clear path to what our future surface transportation will be. Uh, and they've just had great success. Uh, public, there's a lot of public support. It continues to grow for all different types of transit modes. Uh, there's some good shots from some of the various cities. Um, and again, this is a lot about regional advantage. So studies show that business locations near high quality urban settings with clean, efficient rail are a priority for the young knowledge workers. So this is a map I made some time back, it's still fairly current. I wanted to show what's going on around us. And until Oklahoma City, that little P on the blue is now actually operating, but before we even had the streetcar, we were kind of like Mississippi, and I don't know how many times, and I don't want to hear it again on anything, that we're at the bottom of every poll was something on Mississippi, and we don't want to be there on transportation. All the other cities have gotten this, and so again, we're kind of behind, but we have a great opportunity to learn, and uh, it's it's very important for our future economic situation. Uh -huh. Councilor Behrman? Do you have any idea the population of those metro areas compared to ours? Uh, I can assume we're not shooting for Atlanta type numbers. Right, no, no, and, and you're not gonna get there. Again, I'd say Salt Lake City's about 1.3. Okay. Uh, we're a little behind them. And so there's no reason if we do this a similar system that we're not gonna be you know, up in those middle ranges like uh, Charlotte or Austin. Okay. Uh, these are old, but it, I used to use this a lot. I still think it's important to keep us moving forward. Oklahoma City, uh, this was in 2008, ranked last out of the 50 largest metros as best prepared for $4 gas. And we ranked 84th out of 100 in serving the transit needs of our, our workforce. And that's just because we don't have a system. It's, it's just that simple. Uh, never, never invested in one. But it's time now. Uh, everybody drives around. I have an office, our main office is in Edmond. I try not to commute through morning rush hour, but I'm always stuck coming back. 
it takes me at least an hour, no matter when I leave. And now it's solid congestion from, you know, from Hefner Road all the way past Moore. I mean, it's just, you know, it's gotten horrible. Um, so there's not a lot of room left to widen I-35. It's extremely expensive. Um, this is one of the solutions. But um, we, we're reaching that point. Uh, Derek Sparks, who's with the Greater Chamber, Oklahoma City Chamber, told me a couple of years ago that they had gone to Austin and rode the system down there, and they came back and realized, don't do what Austin did. They waited till it was too late. If you wait until your traffic is so bad you need it, you've waited too long. And so we're kind of right at the right point to be, to be doing this. Uh, so how do we make this work? Uh, we need public, political, and business support. Uh, we need to establish an RTA, which we have now done. Big, big step. Uh, we need to have a regional transit district, which is essentially the district that the funding and the system operates in, and secure a dedicated funding source and develop an intermodal hub, commuter rail, streetcar, and bus systems. And we, we are taking small pieces and doing that separately. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Mr. Hutchinson, if we can go back to that slide. Mm -hmm. um, I see it includes bus transit systems. And so what we've been talking a lot about as we approach a vote for funding public transit is that, yes, we're putting a bit of our sales tax to pay for our bus system, but when the RTA comes online, this will fold into that. Is that what you're still envisioning right now? That's what I would hope. And, you know, uh, former council member Ed Shadid in Oklahoma City was also trying to put on a separate vote for, I think it was an eight cent for additions to the bus system. And it would have done the same thing. And we, uh, the new RTA board, we talked about that. And we think it's very valuable. Anything you can add at this time to get those pieces going, essentially, It'll make it easier to pass the district referendum. When we go to a vote for the full funding, it's a single vote. It's not city by city. It will be the entire district votes at once. It will be a lot easier if you've already had a quarter cent. So it's kind of like maps. If you renew it, it's not a new tax. And so I think what you're doing to set that up uh, is really important for the future. It's planning in a step ahead. It will get you ahead of some of the other cities like Moore that – I, I even called and talked to one of their, uh, well, they've got a representative on the board, and I was like, what are, they, what are you going to do with, you know, your part of the jail, of Cleveland County tax? Well, they're going to put it toward water, which is great, but they're going to kind of miss out because we're going to be here sooner than you think on going to a, a vote in a few years, and that money for your bus system, for, it's really critical to think about pieces of, land and property and station locations that you need to protect and you need to be thinking about park and rides and i think that's a really great investment i'm, I'm really glad you mentioned that because as we've all talked about it's public transit and parking fund and so this is setting us up to be able to pay for all that we need with transit not just the bus system including the parking goes which we had discussed earlier possibly doing something at little x to make sure that yeah, I mean, to make sure all of Norman is able to utilize these things, and now we'll have a funding source for it. Council Member Wilson. How do you, uh, or has this conversation happened, envision the um, driverless car impacting any of this? Well, you know. Or is this a fairy tale? <laughs> we actually had our consultant kind of write a white paper on it. Uh, Technology is there to do it in certain implications. Really, do, do we really think that, you know, in our lifetime that everybody, all those cars on I-35, they're all going to pull out of their homes, hundreds of thousands of cars throughout the metro are all going to get onto the interstates and they're all going to self-drive themselves. I mean, that's a great goal to get there. More than likely, where this is going in, in her white paper is that drivers, driverless vehicles can assist in last mile mode. You get off at the station, and maybe there's a driverless Uber or driverless, you know, systems like that. But to actually, re actually, replace the need for transit, and and it's and that would all be functioning <coughs> for the pur the purpose of transit is our mass mass transportation through the car. So I think it's a you know, mm -hmm. I'm not confident it's going to happen anytime soon. Councilman Holman. Yeah, I was going to say I think uh, driverless cars do not solve the problem of congestion. <laughs> So the same number of cars would right. still be on exactly. the street. So 
if not more even. Um, so um, uh, to answer Councilmember Bierman's questions about comparative metropolitan areas, so uh, Oklahoma City as a city has almost 700,000 people. Salt Lake City is at around 200,000 people. So as a city, Salt Lake City is right. not even that much That's larger correct. than Norman. Uh, Oklahoma City's metro area ranks 41st at um, 1.4 million. And Salt Lake City ranks 47th at 1.2 million. So Oklahoma City is a significantly larger city mm -hmm. and metro area than Salt Lake City. And one of, one of our challenges is density because we are spread out. Mm -hmm. But the thing about your primary uh, transit corridors, especially the rail transit corridors, they're in very highly dense, much more dense areas. And I would mention too that Probably a main difference there is that Provo and Ogden are larger than Norman and Edmond, mm -hmm. and they're at each end of the Salt okay. Lake Metro, so their population is more Linear. spread out amongst the Metro, mm -hmm. and ours is centralized mm -hmm. in OKC. Uh, so again, these, this was an ACOG study, Encompass 2035. Uh, I don't think it was scientific, but they had a lot of responses, and preference over future travel, rail was at the top, and I will point out that on expending funds, priorities in transportation systems, adding lanes to interstates is down there at 13 percent. So I, I think it's, you know, it's pretty clear people really uh, would like to, like to have this opportunity and option. Uh, again, this is an old slide, but it's easy to understand. We are fortunately set up in a spoke type system where these are the existing rail corridors and rail lines. The blue is the Union Pacific that runs east-west, green north-south BNSF, and the purple is now the Stillwater Central line. Those all really pass right where you want them to go and they all go right through the center of Oklahoma City and can be you know, connected into a hub real well. Other cities don't have that kind of layout of, of uh, rail trackage, but it, it really sets itself up nice. We've got a line that's hardly used that goes out to the airport. You can have a, a DMU line out to the airport. And that's becoming a very very popular thing in most of the cities. They've got rail transit to the airport and back, out to Tinker. Uh, so we're, we're real fortunate to have these corridors still existing and, and hopefully accessible. So I want to get back to this. This is a big change I'm going to tell you about that's happened just in the last few years. Uh, these are the current generation of commuter rail trains. Uh, it's a company out of uh, Idaho, American-made, uh, motive power, and all the newer systems in the last 15 years, Salt Lake City, Minneapolis, Albuquerque, the C uh, Seattle Sounder, they all use this uh, <coughs> locomotive, which is, it meets two, tier two and tier three uh, EPA air standards, and they pull these Bombardier coaches. Well, they're heavier, they're a little slower, but once they get acceleration up, they, their speeds reach 70 something miles an hour. Well, what's happened in just the last couple of years, <coughs> The FTA finally is allowing, uh, they're called DMUs, diesel multi-units. So the, all these trains run off of, they have a diesel engine that generates electricity to drive electric motors. Electric motors provide high torque. Torque is what you need for fast acceleration. That's why light rail accelerates. They're electric motors. In most trains, even your freight trains, they're diesel electric. So it's got, you're, you're running a diesel engine to generate electricity to run an electric motor. Well, these trains were not allowed by the FTA previously to operate in mixed traffic, meaning on existing tracks with bigger freight trains. They thought there was a safety issue. Uh, light rail cannot do that, but the FTA uh, has new uh, regulations if they meet those criteria. So you can now run these, these DMUs, and the top one is Dallas. This is their new silver line. They're just getting ready to put in, which runs from uh, Carrollton all the way to the airport. Fort Worth, this is in operation. It's called Texrail. It's their new line. It's, it's Fort Worth's first commuter rail line that runs from downtown Fort Worth to the airport. Uh, these are great vehicles, and they're more light rail-like. Uh, they're quicker acceleration, and it's really changed things. P it's, it's, gonna, it's really going to make a difference, and we're here at the right time for that. Uh, a lot of these other cities have already kind of stuck with the older the older models and it would be quite costly for them to switch everything out. But these are really, uh, it's really great new technology. So I want to say this because trains are fun to talk about. Everybody loves to talk about trains. 
people buy in and support regional transit votes and referendums because there's a, tr a rail element, light rail. It's very difficult uh, on these big systems just to go out and say we're just going to you know spend a couple hundred million dollars and just put in buses. Uh, but buses are the backbone of these systems. So we're not just talking about buses. We're talking about operating an expanded bus system, which is very limited right now in Oklahoma City. Norman's had a really good bus system locally. Oklahoma City's has been pretty minor, but they've improved it. But in order to effectively run these, you're not just going to go to downtown and get off on the streetcar. There's going to be a lot of stops. And people riding the trains, when you get off at a train stop, a bus needs to be there to pick you up to get you to wherever else you're going. Um, my wife's dad, uh, she, they moved to uh, Dallas from Oklahoma City, uh, Norman, about 15 years ago for a federal job. And I would have never have thought he would have done it, but he had a dart station nearby. And he would jump on the dart line and ride it downtown and then hop on a bus. And, you know, here he's, he's using the system. And the thing about it is you need those buses to be there <coughs> on time at the station. And so it's, it's a lot easier if one operational entity is coordinating all of that to ensure it works in a, in a network. So buses are a big part of this. And if anybody ever says, oh, you guys aren't, you know, what, what about buses? People really need bus transportation. That's the first thing. Once you pass a referendum and you've got the dedicated funding source, you can start bonding out. The very first thing you're going to do is not start building a rail line. First thing you're going to do is expand your bus system because it's got to be there first and it's got to be working great when the trains pull in. Uh, this is uh, where Oklahoma City first started. COTPA in 2005 did the very first study called the Fixed Guideway Study where we identified uh, these commuter rail corridors. And again, at the time, light rail is very expensive. And so for our economy of scale here, we decided at the time, I guess, commuter rail was the best way to go. Since then, We've made huge strides in just the last 10 years. Uh, from 2009 to 10, uh, ACOG helped run a regional transit. Uh, it's called RTD, where we developed frameworks and um, brought in all the different city representatives to figure out how would we do this, how would we govern it, how would we model it. Uh, we did an intermodal hub study. In 14, o Oklahoma City actually acquired Santa Fe Station downtown, so we have a hub. So we're buying, we're picking up components as we go. It's not as simple as, let's just go to a vote. We don't have anything, and we'll just go get it all at once. We're, you, you get each piece when you can. Uh, we did a commuter corridor analysis, and we'll talk about that in a minute. One of the most important things was in 2014, uh, the, we got the legislature to pass HB 2480 that allows municipalities to join together to form their own RTA and run them however they want without the state telling them what to do. It's great. So... That that was really critical to and us. They haven't preempted that yet. That's <laughs> being here they today. They haven't changed their mind. Council Member Holman. It was also where it said the part about sales tax. Right, was put and in. that that was limited at that point. Uh, not that we will be when we get down the road a little further, closer. We'll be looking at you know other types of what else can you do besides sales tax, uh, but you know you kind of have to live within the reality of it. There's uh, there are other options. Uh, so the metro area cities authorized a regional transit authority task force a few years ago and that was all passed by council and directed uh, that task force which was mainly the mayors to go start working on how we're going to form the rta about the same time they got a big fta grant of about 20 million dollars to uh, redevelop santa fe station it's a gorgeous facility now they've completed the 6.9 mile downtown streetcar system is done i mean and uh and then just the first of this year, we created the RTA. You got to add a new bullet point that in 2019, Norman transitioned to Embark. That's so right. Already on the regional track. And I will say that, you know, a number of years ago, <coughs> there was hesitancy in Edmond and Norman about COP and bus, bus systems. Embark's doing a great job. And even though it was probably tough and a struggle to get through losing CART and that whole transition, you know, probably in in the big picture what's going to happen in Oklahoma City's the you know they're the big city embark may become the operational entity the name but it won't be run under COPPA which is a city trust it would have to be run under the RTA and, a, and a, the board that we've got set up and so the fact that you actually are starting to see embark operate part of that we're we are already ha starting 
operational regional transit. It's just we're just not quite at the, the full mode yet. Uh, these were some of the early studies that and when we looked at how we were going to do a district to vote. This one was based on precincts. Uh, we were trying to cover population and work urban density, employment density. Uh, in the end, when we formed the task force, the decision was made that the district will be based on uh, city boundaries, full city boundaries. So it would be uh, city of Norman, city of Moore, city of Edmond. It would be their full city boundaries. And everybody would vote at once. It would be a single vote. So if, you know, let's just say that everybody in Moore voted no, but everybody else in all the cities voted yes, it's still going to pass. And it's a single vote. This was the commuter corridor study uh, that we finished up uh, back in 2014 or 15. It was just to reinforce uh, the, some of the early assumptions, and it was a lot more of a detailed study, and they did public meetings. Somebody of you may have attended one of those. Uh, and again, it's just it's the same modes. Commuter rail is the locally preferred alternative from uh, Norman. But that envisions four stops in Norman. That one did. Yeah. I think right. it did. We incorporated that mayor into our comprehensive transportation plan, which was happening at the exact same time that this was being developed. Perfect. Uh, this was the signing ceremony of the task force. Uh, so just some of the reasons why we want to create an RTA, why we have created an RTA. Uh, you need a single governance structure for managing and operating these systems. Uh, it really formalizes uh, work between the cities, collaboration. You know, we're not a, to each your own. We're all doing this as a whole, and the train runs both ways. This is to help uh, people throughout the region, no matter what city you live in. Uh, it makes transit services a lot more seamless. Um, the biggest one, our consultant constantly reminds us, follow the money. Part of this is how you get federal funding, federal transit authority dollars, and that's so critical. We talked about this earlier in our meeting. I don't know if everybody knows it, but every time you fill up and pay for fuel, Part of your fuel tax goes to the federal, that fuel tax goes to the federal government. And part of that money goes back to the FTA and gets distributed around the country to transit systems. So all of the money that we've all been paying in for all these decades, a smidgen of it comes back to our bus systems. Most of it's going to build these great systems in the, uh, these other cities. And we're not going to get our money back until we build one of our own. I think that's one of the, the best things about what we're trying to do here. Uh, if you haven't been there, I encourage you to stop by if you're downtown. This is the renovated Santa Fe, which will be Santa Fe Intermodal Station or Santa Fe Station. It's, it's, they have they located a lot of the old uh, light fixtures and storage places. They've, it's really, it's great. Uh, and that, that's ready to go. Uh, the streetcar opened up earlier this year and has been a, a big success. And so it's sitting there. It's until we get the system, it's serving local needs. You know, it's building TOD and and providing local service and the people that live downtown. But it has a bigger need, and its ridership will skyrocket as soon as people are pulling in to Santa Fe Station and getting off and getting on that to ride throughout downtown. Uh, it is set up. I don't have a pointer, but. Uh, Santa Fe Station is right down there in the middle of the Bricktown Loop with the little dash line. It's got tracks actually laid in front of it, and there's stops on each end. Um, so it, it's all prepared to serve the new system. Uh, and we had our Regional Transportation Authority actually, uh, we celebrated and officially uh, formed this at a dedication ceremony uh, early in the year. And this is the first one in the state. This is it. We're the we have the first re, we have the first RTA in the state of Oklahoma. Yeah. So uh, this is I'm going to tell you. So what we're doing now. That's how we got here. And so what are we doing? We have a seven seven member board. Uh, Oklahoma City has two representatives, and the other cities have one. Uh, there was a lot of work that went into how that governance and voting protocol would work. They cannot just vote on their own because they have over 50%. It requires 67.5% of the 
and that means Oklahoma City's two members plus at least Norman and somebody else. There, there, there always has to be multiple members beyond <laughs> Oklahoma City. Uh, so it's, it was well thought out. Uh, the consultant we hired, her name is uh, Catherine Holmes. She's an attorney, and she was general counsel for the Utah Transit Authority for eight years. She was general counsel for the Washington Metro for three years. She's probably the leading rail transit expert on RTA development, has worked with uh, California high-speed rail uh, right-of-way acquisitions. She understands right-of-way. Um, so back when we started the task force, all the cities pledged a total of about $2 million. And so we are currently, our RTA is offering, operating off of money that was previously pledged to hopefully get us to the point of when we go <coughs> to vote. Uh, we still have about, I think, a million dollars in our budget after having done all, all the work we've done, hired the consultants, all the different uh, studies that have gone on to this point. Uh, so we are currently funded. We think those funds probably last through 21 or 22, 2022. Uh, ACOG is providing our staffing. So they're serving essentially as our staff until we get to the point that we're funded and we become an operational entity with our own employees. Uh, like I said, we have a legal and planning consultant that's under contract with us, um, and she is one of the best in the country. Um, and we are currently, we've had uh, consultations and conference calls with the FTA, and right now we're working hard so that the RTA will become qualifying for federal funding. One of the biggest things is that we're new. We need to be able to demonstrate institutional capacity, meaning we can't look like a committee of ACOG. So recently at our last meeting, we have approved in our own procurement policies. Uh, we're getting set up to stand on our own. Uh, we've, we're the, we will be in charge of our own uh, our banking and and we need to step aside and, you know, we need to become our own operating entity. And that's what the FTA looks at to determine how qualified you are or, you know, do you have the capacity to do these things yourself. Uh, we are in conversations, and I must say they're, they're going better than I ever thought they would, with BNSF on operating commuter rail uh, on their north south line. Uh, I would never have guessed how well this has went, but they actually have said if we meet their criteria, they will partner with us, they will ensure it's operated uh, efficiently, and um, would essentially be our partners in making sure that works right. And now it was news to me, but they do that throughout the country. They operate the Minneapolis North Star commuter rail line. So they're in the business of that, and one of the benefits is if you didn't work with them, and let's just say we had to buy our own little 20 foot of their right away and had our own line, you're stuck on your line. If you're working with them, they can move your trains anywhere around on any of their lines they want with their own dispatch, and you don't have to worry about getting in their way. They're going to run it to the best of your efficiency, and the benefit to them is they see federal money coming for transit. There's more trackage that gets built, and these systems don't usually run at night, you know, after commuter time or 10 p.m. So what they get is an extra track that they get to run their trains on. They're, they don't care when they run their trains. They just got to get them to and from where they're going. It's cargo. They'll run them at night on the other trains. So it's a it's a win-win situation for both of them. So that's going really well. Councilmember Scott? If um, BNSF were to work with us or as the RTA, then would we still be strictly dependent upon sales tax to funding it? Or would we have more freedom um, to do other things with that money as far as transportation goes? The, well, actually, we, they would be like a contract operator. So instead of hiring HTMB or so another consultant, like Oklahoma City streetcar system isn't being run by Embark. They've got a contracted, I forgot who, they've got a contracted transit consultant. They pay to run the system for them. Essentially, we'd, be, we'd have to pay BNSF, so it wouldn't really solve that problem. We would pay them with our sales tax and yeah, we'd that would be federal funds. Right. Mm -hmm. They would just be a contract operator, essentially. Uh, we are preparing to go out, hopefully pretty soon, with an RFP to update the commuter corridor study. And one of the things BNSF wants to see, and we need to know, current numbers, costs, ridership figures, they, we need to know, you know, 
we're actually doing this now. It's not, you know, back when we did those other ones, there were studies and plans and hopes and but th this is, you know, it's time. So we're going to be updating that and you will get probably, once that gets underway, maybe in the spring, there will be public meetings and a chance for everyone to have input and we'll talk about that more. Uh, <coughs> and we will be coordinating slowly as we move toward that. We'll need to coordinate with the member cities and the chambers. <coughs> Business is extremely important. Chamber support here on passing a referendum requires a long marketing preparation and planning if you want to do this right. And you I would also recommend in Norman making sure you connect with our Ready for 100 and Sierra Club groups because mm -hmm. we see this as a sustainability issue as much as it is an economic right. issue. Mm -hmm. And right now, I mean, what I hear, you know, it's just kind of mentioned around, oh, maybe two to three years go to a vote. So, but it's all, this is all dependent upon your council, Edmonds council, you know, and it's a juggling act because you're not the only one that, Norma's not the only one that has temporary sales tax. They all have them from different things. They're expiring at different times. You know, it's like when you're ready, they're not. You know, Oklahoma City has maps. I tried to keep telling them, hey, take half of that maps and can it and take the other half and put it to a vote with this. Oh, we don't want to do that. I mean, so it, it's going to, that's going to be a challenge. That's going to be a challenge, but this has all been a challenge, and we're pretty far along. So I think we'll get there. This is my last slide. I just wanted you to kind of see a timeline uh, way back in 2006 and everything we've done in the last, wow, long time. Uh, all of that had to happen, had to take place, had to be successful to get where we are today. And really, we're getting close. All we've got to do now is get ready uh, to convince the voters that this is a this is really important and to pass that vote and we've got a couple of years to work on that so I'm really excited and I hope uh, hope you all are too do you have a super excited Councillor Beerman sorry I was looking at this time um, so throughout all of this I what what's been coming to my mind is how are we making sure that the disability community in all of these cities is served properly mm -hmm. um, so are we in do we know I guess are these streetcars or light rail or commuter rail or enhanced bus systems um, do they have wheelchair or disability accessibility they're components? all required to meet that the if you've been to the they're all low like the streetcar low floor it's all low floor the yeah, that, I mean that's you. We would do that, want to do that anyway. But you're you're under all the federal regulations for all of that. And actually, the Oklahoma City streetcar was not federally funded. That was all paid for just through maps. They did not get a FTA a matching grant, uh, but it's handicap accessible. All the all the uh, stations, everything's set that way. And so that's a great point. I think uh, certainly having representation. You know, ACOG has really done a lot of the the weightlifting throughout all these years to manage all these studies to organize all the events and they've got a large uh, section they have to regularly deal with that so I think um, you know I'm fairly confident up and all the way till now and going forward that's going to be uh, handled very well my hope is that if we can keep that in the forefront of our minds as we are mm -hmm. buying buses as right. an example that we can I have a feeling that we can reduce the reliance on paratransit if we provide a more comprehensive uh, intermodal and multimodal system that serves them a little bit better than the current kind of traditional fixed routes really mm -hmm. provide. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I just think especially those are, when it comes those to are the buses. required <laughs> to, yeah, par paratransit is part of the system. If you can see, that's a small picture. But most of the new Salt Lake City buses in their system were all the enhanced bus with, again, low floor <laughs> entry, that's and that's, you know, that's where you right. want to go. You don't want to cut corners on your vehicles and equipment. You want, when you get there, you want, we want to have really good equipment that serves everybody. Absolutely. Yes, Allison. Councilor Patron. Uh, how much did you say, did you say it was a quarter, quarter cent sales tax? What did you think that it was going to be when we, when we go to a vote? Well... <sighs> I hate to even throw that out there. Uh, it's going to be at least a half a cent. Okay. I've, they've run numbers, and it you know it might need to be a little. I mean, yeah, things I mean, change. Time, you know, that was like 
eight years, six years ago, they were running those numbers. Uh, okay. And of course, as the economy grow and the, they get bigger, it provides more. Uh, Dart, the largest ones I've seen are a, a penny. We're not doing light rail. We're not as big as Dart. I don't. I don't think we need to go that far. Like I said, Salt Lake was like 0.6 something. So I'd say maybe half minimum, maybe a little more, you know. I think that's it. Any other, any other questions? Yeah, that's good. Well, this is very exciting. Again, if you've seen me present on uh, the 8% sales tax, I talk about how when we got the notification, I went through like the eight stages of grief on how we were going to manage this, but it looks like we have an excellent opportunity to really commit early on to regional transit, which will be a game changer for Norman. I mean, imagine people who are in Edmond and want to go tailgate at a friend's, uh, to, not even go to the game, but it's not worth it because they don't want to drive. I mean, this is going to be such an economic driver for our community on top of accessibility issues, making sure people can get where they need to go. And enjoy everything we're investing in. It opens in up our, the original job market. So. And I'll, I'll make one comment. If you talk about this and hear from people, especially in Oklahoma City, uh, sometimes they look at it like, yeah, sure, you all want it because you want to get here. And, you know, I, I've said this so many times. I don't know how many times my wife has asked me, hey, do you want to go down to eat dinner in downtown Bricktown or something this you know, weekend? And I'm like, no. I drive <laughs> down. I'm not going down there. But I tell you what, if we had a train here and I can go down there and get a streetcar and go to a game, go eat dinner, ride back, and people are going to come the other way. You know, everybody wants to try different things. Someone wants to come from Oklahoma City to come to Norman. Trains run both ways. It's important to, to pass that, those thoughts on to the people that kind of just think about it in a one directional mode. And, and building on, on how people think of things, you may have heard, as I have, that who uses public transportation in Norman well, that's about to grow significantly once we get this in place. So this is the time to invest, especially with the opportunity to not see a sales tax rate increase for our residents. Yep. You tell those Beautiful. people in Oklahoma City, you'd be like, do you have a world market? Because Norman has a world market. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, what we do. Hey, and all, and, 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 and it's house. important. That's right. <laughs> Everyone's, everyone, whatever, whatever it is, if it's sales tax, it mm -hmm. is, everyone's sales tax goes up together. So it's not like it, it doesn't, you know. Kind of stays the same. It's not competitive. All right, Councilmembers, you have eight minutes to prepare yourselves for a marathon. Very exciting.